it takes a long time to stay ahead of the stand ahead of the game. So thank you so much for your patience on this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Let me introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Kevin Deacon-Craft, uh, and I teach in political science. I also teach in the Honors College, uh, and I have the, the great good fortune to be able to work at Wayne also with our fellowship students. So uh, among all those many hats, uh, I also ha have occasion to do research. Uh, and it's kind of exciting for me to be able uh, to talk to the students of the university, the Political Science uh, Students Association, the Honors College uh, and International Week about the, the work that I do uh, abroad. Uh, and so what I wanna do today is to uh, take you through just a really simple vision uh, of some stuff that I've spent the last 10 years doing, uh, stuff that resulted in this particular uh, bound bunch of pages, which doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, in the process uh, will involve really 10 years of, uh, of effort with myself and my co-author. But let me start just with, with thank yous. Uh, I really wanna thank Devin Reynolds. Actually, hold on just a second. There we go. I wanna thank Devin and the Political Science Students Association. Uh, you all have done an amazing job. The organization ebbs and flows, and it is certainly under uh, a flow forward under, under your leadership. So thanks for making this possible, for giving me the idea to want to do this. Uh, thank you to John Brender uh, and the Office of International Programs. Thank you to the Honors College uh, for making this part of their Honors Author Series. So thanks to all of you, and thanks to all of you at home. There are a bunch of you there. Uh, so it's nice to see everybody and uh, hopefully to be seen and heard as well. So thanks to everyone. And I want to thank someone who's not here. Uh, his name is Tim Houghton, and he is my co-author. Uh, I wish all of you in your life the, the same kind of good fortune in finding someone to work closely with, someone who both thinks uh, enough like the way you think to be able to work together, but differently enough uh, that you can actually be productive and, and learn from one another. Someone who is kind uh, enough to, to allow that, that mutual relationship and tough enough when the deadlines are coming to say, you need to hand this in. My, my particular problem. So I want to thank Tim. Uh, he's not here, but uh, he is here with us in spirit. He knows I'm going to be talking today. Now, and anyone who wants to talk about this, uh, send me an email. I'll connect you with Tim because I know he would be glad to, to discuss this as well. So what I really want to do is to talk about this particular book. Uh, and I want to try and talk about it in a way that isn't as dull as the actual book. Uh, you know, when by the time you get to a, to a book this long and by the time you get to a press like, like Oxford University Press, these things have to be pretty academic, pretty scholarly. Uh, I used to write well, now I write accurately. Uh, but what I'd like to do actually is to try to do a mix of both uh, and talk a little bit about what's in this particular book. Uh, and one of the nice things uh, actually our press allowed us to do was to be a little bit creative uh, in, in some of the stuff that we did. So I'm gonna move this really quickly. There we go. Uh, and they actually let us start the book uh, with a story. So literally the opening of the book kind of a bedtime story. So not to put you to sleep, but let me start the way the book starts. Because we start, once upon a time, there was a king who created a new political party, which he named after himself. He promised to clean up the country's politics. He won more votes than anyone else and became prime minister. But politics didn't become much cleaner. And he didn't win as many votes the next time. Almost no one lived happily ever after, except for his bodyguard who created his own political party, promised to clean up the country's politics, won a lot of votes, and became prime minister. That's the first paragraph. Uh, we, we go through four more paragraphs about different kinds of people who did the same kind of thing. So in addition to the bodyguard uh, in a different country, there was the game show host. The game show host who ran ads that depicted he and his fellow party mates as criminals, as uh, madmen, uh, as vampires, uh, and as prostitutes, uh, the top one says, we'll give the general, uh, the, the, the procurator general something to do. But the second one says, let us help us enter this ship of fools. And it's a picture of the Seimach, which is the Lithuanian parliament. The third one says, we'll fight for you tooth and claw. And the fourth one says, we won't steal from you. We can earn our own money. Um, all of these are a political candidate running for office who took second in that country's election. At the time when we saw these, we were stunned. We'd never seen anything like this but we kind of knew it was coming because we'd seen a bunch of other people do similar stuff. So in addition to the game show host, there was the supermarket chain manager uh, and there was the magistrate uh, and there was the comedian 
Uh, and in fact, the, the comedian followed on immediately after the, the apolitical magistrate, and there were others. There was the rock star, and there were the in investigative journalists, and there was the TV psychiatrist, and on and on and on. We could list all the different kinds of people who became politically prominent, who won political office, sometimes became heads of government uh, in countries throughout the region that I study, which is Central and Eastern Europe. So this was the story as of the time that, that, we, that we finished the book. Um, and fortunately for us, but unfortunately for the people of the countries that we deal with, uh, the story didn't, didn't end with these, with, with these particular stories. We would have been very happy to have noticed a phenomenon of a particular time, to have that phenomenon go away and never appear again. We could, we could deal with our book as a kind of historical artifact. But in fact, since we published this book in late 2020, in the same country where there was the bodyguard, there was this guy, this guy, this guy in his political party. He's, he's, a, he's a talk show host and rock musician, got the most votes of any political party uh, in Bulgaria. And six months later, because he couldn't form a government and there were new elections, he was replaced with these guys, one of whom was apparently a John Travolta lookalike. Um, and, and these guys who were out of nowhere, also a new political party, have never held uh, elected office before. All of this happened in the country of Bulgaria, but we found that this has happened all over Central and Eastern Europe, and in fact, all over the world. And this was the story we sort of set out to tell. So we, we, we looked at the region that we care about very deeply, and we saw something weird was happening. So this is what I wanna to do today. I wanna to talk very briefly, and actually more briefly than I would have because of the time we took getting set up today. But I wanna talk about actually what we did as scholars, as researchers, very quickly about that. I want to talk about what it was we found. So what's the substance of what we found? Uh, and I want to talk about why we think it's important. We need all of those elements. And in any presentation by an academic, you really need to probe them as to why, how did you, how did you get the results that you got? What is it that you found? And, and why should we even care? So let me start with this question of what we did. And the biggest thing we did, and for those of you who are interested in this kind of work, uh, I really recommend to you simply going places and talking to people. This is the core of what we do as academics. Obviously, we have a method for how we do it, who we choose to talk to, and so on. But frankly, going to political party offices, this was an office I frequented quite, quite a bit during, during, during the 2000s, uh, going to political offices, making appointments with people, sitting in their offices, in this case, sitting in their offices over multiple bottles of wine until by the end of the conversation, neither of us were fully cognizant of what we were doing. But lots of great things came out and lots of interesting things that I wouldn't have expected they'd tell me uh, happened because of that. But we didn't just go to the big ones, we went to the small ones. Um, and we also supplemented that with a lot of book research, data research. So quantitative data, we looked at the electoral websites of every single country, we analyzed the data in detail. We even went a little bit further uh, and used computer simulations to try and understand the dynamics that we were looking at. So what we call, we would call this a mixed methods approach, a lot of qualitative, just discussing con conversation, a lot of quantitative work where we calculated things and tried to figure them out, uh, and even some additional sort of speculation and, and simulation. So that's the big picture of how we did what we did. What did we find? So during the period from about 2010 to about 2019, we went to 11 different countries, uh, in what is variously called Central Europe, Eastern Europe, post-communist Europe. And we went to all 11 countries in that region that were then part of the former Soviet bloc and are now part of the European Union. And so for practical purposes, that means it's Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, it's Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, uh, it's Slovenia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. So those are all the countries that we went to. And we talked to every single political party in every one of those countries, which is actually slightly harder than it sounds because when we went there, the parties were different than when we finished. So we had to go back around and check again. But we, every single one at, at every visit, we, we talked to somebody from every single one. And in many cases, multiple meetings, five, 10 meetings with, with some of the more interesting parties. What did we get out of it? Well, we found really three different kinds of things. And so here's the first thing I want to say. Well, first thing we found was patterns. So the political party systems of these countries are really complicated, and you'll see how complicated in just a minute. So the first thing we had to do was just figure out what the hell was going on. In order to do that, we actually drew maps. Some of them were actual physical maps of spaces, of places, and, and some of them were maps of how parties exist, so kind of infographics. 
but we needed these infographics for us to understand what was going on. So we created party maps to understand those patterns. And here's an example of a party map. And you can see from the little button down in the corner, this is the party map of the United States. This is the simplest possible party map that you could make. Each one of these lines going across, every color represents a particular political party. And the width of the line represents what share of the votes they got at any given time. So sometimes in the United States, Democrats get more votes than Republicans, sometimes Republicans get more votes than Democrats, and it sort of oscillates, it cycles, it cycles back and forth. Not very interesting, no real reason to make a map for this. It gets a little bit more interesting when we go to my colleague Tim's home country of, of Britain. So in Britain, you actually have a conservative party and a labor party and the liberal democratic party. And also you've got a little green party, you've got the, the Scottish national party. So there's a little bit more complexity and you've got the UKIP party, which favored Brexit. Later than that, the Brexit party, you have parties sort of splitting and merging with one another. So it starts to get a little bit more interesting. But this is nothing compared to Slovakia. This is Slovakia's political party system over time. As we go from 1990 to 2000, every one of these is a political party. Every one of these is coming and going. And I heard an oof from all of you. Slovakia is not the most complicated one. This is Bulgaria. And this is Bulgaria's political party system as of a week ago. This is Bulgaria's political party system as of a Sunday. So you can see every single one of these is a political party. And every time we see something sort of emerging, disappearing, it's a signal that something is going on, that parties are coming and, and parties are going. This is way too complicated for the human brain to deal with. I can barely deal with it. So we actually sort of simplify it down. So we take all the labels off, take all the colors off, but you can see what it looks like. And what we did with these maps was to sort of try and use them to figure out where there were significant events. So once we organize it like this, we can actually say, okay, where are the births? These are all parties that are born in, 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 in Bulgaria. And, and every one of them had to have at least 1% of the, of the vote. In the United States, that was literally three parties and sometimes not even the Libertarian Party. Uh, in, in Bulgaria, over this period, you see there are about 60 different parties that were born uh, with at least 1% of the vote and many of them born at 25, 30% of the vote. In one case, born at 42% of the vote. And these are the deaths. So a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Halloween. This is worse than my neighbor's over-decorated Halloween lawn. Um, but all of these represent a party that, and you can see a substantial share of parties that were born were dead. Sometimes decades later, sometimes a year later, sometimes a couple months later. So we get this mixture of birth and death. And to use our story metaphor, it, it doesn't always go well for, for those particular parties. And that leaves us with the parties that are currently alive. Now, actually, I haven't updated this for Sunday's elections because some of the parties here are dead and there are some new ones in addition that aren't on here. But you can see that some of the parties were born a long time ago and continue to survive. So parties down here, they really were at the very beginning, although these parties, actually this party suffered a significant loss in the most recent election. And some of the parties were born just a few months ago. Uh, and literally the party that, that got the most votes in Bulgaria's election on Sunday was founded less than two months ago. So 25% of the votes starting from zero. So it's basically, you know, it's a, it's a, if it were a car, it would be zero to 100 in about two and a half seconds. This is what we see when we look at Bulgaria's political party system. And Bulgaria's on the outer edge, but it is by no means unusual. And you saw Slovakia, but I could put Czech Republic or Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, any of those countries they would fit in that in that space. So we did this and we found a lot of patterns and then we actually systematized those patterns. Uh, we used uh, quantitative methods to actually calculate the average age of political party systems. Unlike all of us who are getting older at about a year every year, the political party systems of these countries are getting older at about nine months every year six months every year. In other words, the country is getting older, the democracy is getting older, but the average age of political parties, because there's so much coming and going, the average age of the party system doesn't get that much older. And in some cases, we've actually seen party systems get younger after an election as older parties die and new parties pop up. It's a pretty remarkable phenomenon. So then having seen this, we tried to dive in to the actual political parties that we were seeing and the, number, the ones that were appearing and, and disappearing. So what we did was to analyze these and try to figure out what, what did they have in common? And we found three things. 
first thing we found was lightweight organization. In other words, these parties were built around social media. They were built around followers. They were built around pages. What they were not built around was offices in particular places, was membership, were events in physical space. So they were very much virtual organizations. They were very much organizations that existed in the cloud, that existed out there but not organizations that necessarily existed in the physical world in a way that people would encounter one another. In many ways, these parties sort of predate COVID. Like the, the universe of these parties is the, is the universe of Zoom. It's the universe of everything that we did at this university uh, in, the last, in the last year and a half, and not what we're doing now here, and not what we did before, before COVID. The second thing we found about all these parties, is that they dealt with new issues. So most political parties, most of the time, deal with things like money, taxes, how much do we take in, how much do we spend? Or they deal with questions of identity, ethnic majorities and ethnic minorities, racial majorities and racial minorities, cultural majorities and minorities. In this case, what we found is that most of these new parties, they, they stayed away from those kinds of questions. So they would answer questions about where are you, left or right, with things like, we are neither left nor right, but forward, which doesn't really mean very much. So they didn't really have any questions about economic questions in many cases, or the party that just won the, the Bulgarian elections say that they believe in, in, in left-wing left -wing results with right-wing policies, which if you believe that that means anything to you, there's a new party I could sell you probably from one of these countries. So they didn't, so if they didn't really respond, they didn't talk about that, what did they care about? Corruption. Corruption was the thing that almost every single one of these parties positioned itself as an anti-establishment party, a party that would throw the bums out and replace them with a better alternative. And because the parties were new, they could say, look, our opponents have a track record of corruption. They've stolen from you and stolen again. We're new at this. We don't have that kind of track record. And so we're gonna clean things up. In some cases, they had, they had actual credentials for cleaning things up. In other words, in other cases, their credentials were simply not being the guys who were in power at the time. Third thing we found was dominant celebrity leaders. So these parties tended to have individual political party leaders. And sometimes the party was built around them to such extent that the party was actually named after the leader. So in many cases, there were, uh, there were parties named after particular leaders, especially in the Bulgarian case that we saw. In the most recent Bulgarian elections, there was a party that chose not to name itself after the leader, but after one of his songs, for example. So we get this kind of, they're very focused on the leader and there's no real way to get the leader out. Whether the party's named after these leaders or not, there are no mechanisms for removing them. And in the country of Slovakia, where I study, until about three months ago, every single party in parliament was led by the person who founded that party. Not a single one of them had ever experienced a single change in leadership of the party. So they are focused around these leaders and these leaders are quite often, not always, but quite often celebrities. So they're people who come in from the outside of politics with some kind of external status. Either they're super rich or they're super famous in some way, or they have some particular characteristic, some particular aspect. And many of them, not surprisingly, were involved deeply in media, old media or new media. So we see, for example, the people who I mentioned, the television journalists, the television newscasters, the, the television psychiatrists, the actors. We see rock musicians, quite a few musicians, uh, especially uh, in, in, Southern, in Southern Europe. Um, we see a lot of people from reality TV shows, particularly things like the, well, things like The Apprentice or things like Shark Tank. Uh, we see uh, a lot of people who have connections in the business world in one way or another, people who've made a lot of money, uh, often from, uh, from internet stocks and, and, and other kinds of startup businesses. These are the kinds of people who run these kinds of, of, of parties, and they tend to run them as their own private company. So this is what these parties are like. We then did one other thing. We looked we kept, we, we kept it blind and we looked at what kinds of parties survived and what kinds of parties died over time. So if you're a party, do you want a lightweight, flexible organization or do you want a kind of organization built around members that, that has you know, brick and mortar offices and, and flesh and blood people showing up? 
if you are a party, do you want to deal with those? If you want to survive, do you deal with those new issues like corruption or do you with old issues like, like economic left and right? And if you're a party, do you want to work with a dominant celebrity leader or do you want to have constant leadership change or at least frequent leadership change? Any guesses on that from the audience? Which one of these do you want? Yeah, which ones do you want? I know what I would want for the stable one, but I'm guessing the answer is the opposite. Well, so what you would want if you want your party to last for a long time is actually exactly what these parties didn't have. So if you look at political parties, the parties that last longest are parties with brick and mortar organization with actual tangible members. It's probably true of university classes and university education as well. What we did during COVID was a fix for a deep problem, but it's not something that we would want to do in perpetuity. That's what these parties have discovered because most of them have died, as you saw from that sheet. In terms of issues, it turns out that left and right issues, they're much harder to, to manage on uh, and they're much harder to break through into politics with, but they last longer. With corruption issues, if you make corruption your key issue and then you turn out to be corrupt, you've lost everything that you stood for and you can't get, you can't get back from that. There was a question. Yes, I love it. Yes. So the question is, once you have leaders, just for the audience, once you have, if a leader dies, is does the party die? So my, 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 my co-author and I actually have a kind of macabre test we call the bus test which is if the leader is hit by a bus, what happens to the political party? And in almost every case, the party dies. In almost every the party fragments, it splinters, it goes away. And sometimes you don't even have to wait for the bus. We all know about waiting for the bus in Detroit because it takes a long time. You don't have to wait for the bus because in many cases that leader will not die, but prove to be really corrupt. So the game show host, for example, who, who, who ran uh, on, you know, on the, on the the, the platform of, of keeping the, the, the attorney general really busy prosecuting corruption, three months after his election was photographed in, in uh, Lithuania's hottest night spot with the family of the leading mobster of Lithuania. So all it takes is for you to prove that you were just as bad as the other, or even almost, or even get a sheen of looking as bad as the other guy, and it can, it can drag you down. Now, with this third one, a dominant celebrity leader, it turns out that that one wasn't as conclusive as the other. In other words, sometimes a dominant celebrity leader can stay strong for a while, can keep a party up or keep it at a plateau for a while. But one of two things happens. Either something happens to, to cause that leader to be corrupt. And if the leader can't be severed from the party, the party is going to go down with the leader. Or if the leader can't be severed before the leader is severed from this mortal coil, then the party's going to fall apart after that leader's death because they almost never leave the party in a position where they've got an appointed successor and so on. So it's a really good question. So if you want to live for a long time, you don't do what these new parties do. If you want to live for even a medium amount of time, you don't want to even do the, you, you can live for a medium amount of time with a dominant celebrity leader, but you can't live in perpetuity. You can't live more than one generation. So we're seeing two kinds of parties that emerge here, two kinds of new parties the flash party that emerges and disappears, and the generation party that emerges, lives as long as its leader stays politically active and then disappears. But we have seen very, very few cases of parties that have managed to, to fix all three of these problems to convert themselves into the kind of party that lives long. So that's what we found there. There's one other thing that we found, and this actually maybe isn't the most important thing, but it's the thing that we didn't expect to find but that we think is actually one of the more interesting things that, that, um, that, that is relevant here. Because what we found was that there were relationships, not just between these parties, but between different parties over time. And let me give you an example sort of of what that, what that means. All of the literature on, on new political parties relating to Western Europe. And I will say, if anyone's studying political parties, almost everything that we do to study political parties is written by, was written by Westerners in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, which was a very unusual time. At the time they were writing it because they were Western European, because they were white guys, they assumed that that's the way the universe naturally was, because of course that's the universe that they lived in. But it turns out that that kind of period of stability that Europe saw during the post, during the Cold War period was actually quite unusual. So almost all of the basic models and theories are built to expect stability, whereas in fact, we should expect instability. At least that's what we think we're, we're learning. So all of those old models said that one of two things happens with a new political party. 
some cases, the new political party appears. It maybe succeeds for one election, it disappears, and all the voters go back to where they were before. And it's kind of like you throw a, a, a pebble into a pond, it creates some ripples, but then eventually you really can't tell the ripples are there anymore. And we've actually seen this in the United States. So we saw this with the, with the People's Party, the, the, the progressives, with the state's rights party, with the reform party. This has happened in the United States with their parties come in. They, they do well for one term or for one election, and then they kind of disappear and they don't, they don't sustain themselves. The other thing that happens to political parties is they come in and then they stick around. Now, the last time this happened in the United States was so long ago that the party that did that is now considered one of the two mainstream parties, obviously. Uh, but so parties come in and disappear, they come in and they stick around, but there's no medium, medium ground there. What we found was something different. We found in many of the countries that we were looking at that parties would come in and they would die. And their voters wouldn't go back to the established parties. They would go on to a new party, which would die. And the voters would go on to a new party, which would die, go on to a new party, which would die, and so on. So we call this subsystems because what we see is a kind of relationship among various parties over time moving, moving forward. So in the country of Slovenia, for example, the party Zarez, uh, was replaced by two different parties, Positive Slovenia and the Civic List, which was replaced by the party of Miro Serar. So you can see the name there, Miro Serar is a guy's name. Uh, interestingly, when Miro Serar stopped being popular, they actually changed the name of the party to the Party of the Modern Center. So same initi initials, just different names. And that was replaced by the party of Marian Sharetz, another party name. They haven't changed that party's name yet to something else because Sharetz remains sort of moderately popular. Uh, but we'll see what happens in Slovenia. Slovenia's elections come up next year, and we're fully expecting something else to happen. And not only is this kind of coincidence that a party appears and then a new party appears, what we actually found was the voter flow happened. So we looked at tons of public opinion polls and other kinds of measurements. Uh, and what we actually found in the case of Slovenia here was that in the first case, this case of Zada, 70% of Zada's voters went to these new parties in wave two. 55% of those voters went to new parties in wave three. 35% of those voters went to new parties in wave four. And there was a constant sort of pumping of voters away from the established parties and up into the newer parties. So new parties would attract people, but they would never send as many back to the established parties as they got from them. And we found this over and over again when we looked. We found it in, in Slovenia, we found it in the Czech Republic, we found it in, in Slovakia, um, uh, and in a whole bunch of, of, of other places. So we're seeing this happening in a, in a whole variety of places. And even in places like Iceland and places where you might not necessarily expect it. So we found this really complicated framework. We found that new parties are different than old parties and in ways that cause them to die sooner. And we found that when they die sooner, they bequeath their voters to newer vote, to newer parties, and that the cycle keeps going and going and going. Why, why would anyone care about that? I mean, if you live in Bulgaria, you should care about it. If you live in Slovakia, you should care about it. But why would any of you care about it? And this is honestly a real thing that I think we as academics should try and think about from time to time. Like, what's the relevance? It's not that what we do is strictly about relevance, but it's important to say, is there any way that what I'm learning here can help make our lives better as a species? It's not the, the goal of what we do necessarily, but it, it can be. And if you can do both things at the same time, then we should do them. I think there are a couple of reasons why I should care, because first of all, it's not just happening in, in Central Europe. When we looked closer, we found this all different spots in, in the place that we were studying, but we found them in a lot of different places. So we found them in Japan and South Korea. We found them in Taiwan and the Philippines. We, we found them in Thailand and in India. We found them in Mozambique and Benin. We found them all over Latin America, from Mexico to Chile to, to Peru to Guatemala. And you might say, United States? Like, where's this happening in the United States? Now, you might be thinking, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about Andrew Yang's choice of a third party. This isn't actually what I mean. I mean, you know, best of luck to the guy, but do we really expect that this is going to go anywhere? Maybe it will. The Onion actually satirized it by saying that he was going to find a fourth party because the third party didn't take off. Um, but but this, this isn't what I mean. When I say that this stuff is in the United States, I think third parties come and go. The United States has a winner-take-all electoral system that is very hard to create new parties within, at least new competitive parties. But 
Do, do these things look familiar to you? Have you ever seen these in your own country? Where have you seen them? Can you think of any politicians who do this kind of talk about this kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, kind of. I mean, I would say, you know, maybe Bernie's more comfortable like that, but I would say, I would say both Trump and Sanders in very different ways, especially the new issues of corruption, especially the sort of celebrity that they develop. Anytime you get a meme, this kind of meme effect from a candidate, you know you're dealing with a celebrity leader. And by lightweight organization, they don't mean no organization. They both did stuff, but they didn't do stuff in that traditional way. Right? Trump's campaign was really going around holding rallies in airport hangs. Right. Bernie did a lot more, had more kind of robust organization than, than, than Trump did, but it was still a different kind of organization built around different modes of organizing. And I would say this kind of stuff pops up a lot, that, that AOC has a lot of characteristics of a lot of these, of these leaders. Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley have a lot of characteristics of a lot of these leaders. People like The Rock, or Mark Cuban say they're gonna run for president, they're not gonna run alone, they're gonna run within one of the two major parties. And so what Tim, my colleague and I argue is that while we may not see a bunch of third parties, fourth parties emerging in the United States, what we increasingly see is that the major parties are vulnerable to capture by subgroups within those parties that look a lot like these parties from Central and Eastern Europe and other places around the world. And we argue that's kind of worrisome because of the nature of these parties. And this is the last thing that, that, that I'm gonna say, because we found that there are some issues or some, some problems, not just in their life expectancy, but with the, the parties overall. So one of our gurus, one of the people in our field who we have the most respect for uh, is an Irish political scientist uh, who died just a few years ago named Peter Mayer. Uh, and Peter Mayer uh, said that when we look at parties and, and really not just from a political science standpoint, but from a do they do the job standpoint, that parties have, need to have two features and they need to have them both at the same time, even though they're, 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 they're not entirely consistent all the time. And the first one is that parties need to be responsive. They need to listen to what people say and they need to do something about it. That's what it means to live in a democracy. And they need to be responsible. Parties need to think seriously about the society in which they live and what it needs, regardless of what they need in their own short-term political development, if the democracy and the society are to survive. We really do need that. So we need some kind of balance. If you, know, you can be both at the same time, if what the people want is actually what the society needs, you're in great shape. If they're at conflict, you need a little bit of both. You need some responsiveness to make sure you're not just going off and doing whatever you think without listening. And you need some responsibility to make sure that you're actually paying attention to the deeper, broader needs of, of society. In Eastern and Central Europe, the coming of these new parties was oftentimes heralded as the beginning of a new era of responsiveness. Uh, these parties said that we're going to remove the corrupt people who are there. Uh, we're going we're to get citizens back involved again. And even if we don't get rid of the old establishment, we're going to force them to compete again. We're going to force them to enliven their, their campaigns. They're going to have to get serious about this and not just be complacent the, the way they were. So in theory, new parties actually bring a lot to the game. They can create a more responsive system. That's the theory. In practice, what we tended to find was that those parties were just as likely to become corrupt as the, as the ones that had come before. Um, they often just disillusioned the citizens. So they ran on an anti-corruption campaign uh, and then became corrupt. And then people, instead of getting re-energized for multiple elections, thought, oh God, they're all the same and disengage from the political system. And when they did win, it's not like they re-energized the establishment. They often became the establishment that they were fighting and, and they tried to put a lock on the system to keep other parties from competing. So we found that a lot of the appeals of these parties, the reasons you might think that they are good for the system actually are not that beneficial. They have some sort of marginal effects, but they're not, they're not always uh, in one direction. And the big problem we found came with regard to responsibility. Because what, what seems to happen with these parties is that they don't live long enough to actually achieve goals in the long term. And in fact, because they begin to know that they're not gonna live very long, they begin not to have long-term goals at all. And so my colleague and I have been working with the notion, and we're still at the beginning of our work with this, but the notion of a time horizon. So the horizon is how far out you can see. 
if you think of that not in terms of space, but in terms of time, what's the horizon? What's the distance at which you are planning? Is it the next hour? Sometimes when I'm teaching, when I'm talking, it's about the next minute to make sure that the words come out of my mouth. Some days it's the next week. Sometimes it's the next year. If I really sit down and think about it, I can build myself a five-year plan. And I'm sure some of you have gone even further out than that. It's what we do when we work with fellowship students and, and, and others. How far out are you thinking? When a party is deeply established, a bunch of different research has found that when a party neither expects to lose nor expects to win. In other words, it's in that intermediate zone. It, it believes it has a strong chance of winning, but it's not a lock on winning. It knows that it might lose, but it doesn't expect to lose. Those are the parties that are able to think the longest. They're the ones that are able to implement the policies that have the longest term payback because they can invest now in getting voters 10 years from now. They're still gonna be around 10 years from now, but they're gonna need those voters because they don't have a lock on the system. So it's in that middle space, that kind of Goldilocks space that we want parties to be. Short-term parties, new parties, ones that, that, that don't build those kind of long-standing relationships and therefore don't necessarily expect to be around, those parties do not necessarily build for the long run. And in fact, the studies that we've looked at have found that those kinds of parties invest solely in the kinds of goods that will get them election in the next election or even before then will hold the party together for the next couple of years rather than investing in the long run. And I'd say if your horizon is bright, right? If, there's, if there are no clouds on the horizon, maybe that's okay to have parties that look at the, at the short run. But the, the problem is, I really think we are in a world at the moment, particularly on climate questions, but also on sustainability questions, also on a variety of economic questions, where we cannot afford to have parties that are not looking at the medium, but especially at the longer run. I mean, we are facing a series of problems right now, which, which literally threaten human existence, at least human civilization on the planet, which if they are not tackled, if they are not dealt with, will, will, will produce excessively problematic results, really deep pain for a huge share of the population, unless we can look in that long run. But if our parties are looking only at the short run, there is no way that you can solve any of those parties. So our problems are getting longer, the time horizons for solutions are getting longer, and the parties themselves, their time horizons seem to be in these countries getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And for us, that's a real cause for concern. So that's the downer note I wish I wanted. We can actually talk about problems and solutions and, and ways of doing it. But that's, that, this is what this kind of research leads to. We start by looking at a couple of countries that are fascinating to us, and we end up uh, talking about the, the, the risks facing the globe as a whole. So I'm gonna stop talking because I've already gone on way too long and I'm gonna see if there are any questions either from you or uh, Gabby, if you can put them in in the chat from the audience. So I'm gonna be looking both at you and, and at them, but thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. Any questions? Well, hey, Professor Deacon Krauss, I'll ask one. Um, right. Your presentation was great. I didn't find any of your results to be surprising. I mean, everything that you said made perfect sense, but I'm so glad to have real data from you to back it up so that I'm not just talking smack with my friends. So if everything to me seemed, yeah, that makes good sense. Was there anything that you and your colleague found that really surprised you? Or did it yeah, let, and just let confirm what you said? Up on the main screen here, hold on just a second, so that people can know that you exist. Right, that's not it, hold on. Hold on. Oh, wouldn't you know it, it's not gonna work just because, there we go, yay. Hold on, excellent. So, and I'm sure everyone here heard, the question is what we found that wasn't, that was surprising, that, that we didn't expect. I would say first, we didn't, we didn't expect to find any of this stuff. We were just looking at why a couple of particular parties survived and, and, and you know, why, other, why other parties were new. So at the very beginning, we didn't know what we were looking for. It was kind of a, wow, 
that's a new party. We haven't seen a lot of those new parties. I wonder what's going to happen to that party. The more we studied, the more we started to see patterns and patterns in one country after another after another. The most surprising thing I would say is that we didn't expect this to go on so long. So we, what we expected was to see a series of a new party would appear, voters would vote for it, they would be disappointed. Maybe then a second new party would appear, voters would vote for it, they would be disappointed and they would go back to the old parties that they used to vote for because at least they're not that bad. So we expected that this would be a book about a limited time period um, and that it would have a kind of termination date. There would be an expiration point here. What we didn't expect was that it would keep happening. And especially what we didn't expect was that it would start accelerating. So the example that I started with, the king, followed by the bodyguard, followed by the rock star, followed by the, uh, the two investment bankers, that happened in Bulgaria. And it's, it's happening in, in increasing speed. So the, the distance in time between Bulgaria's new democracy and the king was about 10 years. The distance in time between the king and the bodyguard was about six years. And the distance in time between the bodyguard and these other parties has been again 10 years, but in the last 11 months, we've seen a new party emerge, get super successful, disappoint people, fail and already be replaced by a new party within the year. So we did not expect that. We did not expect people to say, well, if that new party isn't gonna work, I'll go to another one and another one and another one. And that's actually where we wanna do our research now. We really wanna start doing that. The other place where we were a little bit surprised was in the, in the incredible role of celebrity. So, I mean, it was, it was kind of apparent at first, but what we really started to discover was that in the economy that we live in, and you probably have heard, there are certain models that say that we've gone from a producer economy to a service economy, to what some people now call an attention economy. So in the producer economy, what's scarce is the stuff that you're making, the food or, or, or the vehicles. In a service economy, you have those things and what's scarce is the actual services around them. So that's really where the attention goes. And when you go one step further, in an attention economy, what's scarce isn't the, the ability to, um, to produce stuff or the ability to talk about it, it's the ability of our brains to process all of that information. So really what the scarcity is, is your ability to pay attention to any given thing. And the fact that all of you are sitting in this room for an hour listening to a guy in a mask talk about parties shows that you have a particular capacity for, your, for, for focusing your attention. But these days, most people are bombarded all the time. If the attention is the scarcest commodity in our society, which some people argue, then the one thing that gives you an incredible advantage in that is the ability to come in already famous, the ability to come in already able to bring eyes to screen so that you can cut through that attention, uh, that attention deficit and make that. So what we've seen, the number of rock stars and, and television personalities and social media stars, that's been kind of striking to us. It's maybe not as surprising, but it is, it is notable how much is happening. Does that get at the kind of question you were asking? Definitely, it makes a lot of good sense. Thank you. I don't. I, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's what we're <laughs> no. Saying. But you make it easy to understand. Any other questions? Yes, John. Um, do you have any data or predictions of a long-established uh, brick-and-mortar party that suddenly got for lack of a better word hijacked <laughs> by an individual <laughs> and the the aftermath or you know what what happens after so you're you're clearly speaking about the spanish partido pop no you're speaking yeah. i think there's a particular party you may be speaking of um no no real data on that um i mean what's what's interesting about the united states and i assume you're talking about the united states what yeah what's interesting about the united states is that the almost not only the, the election rules that we've got the winner take all system but all of the, the underlying sort of social conditions, everything is really geared toward only having two parties. It's very hard to do anything that looks like a third party in the United States. But when that new party starts to behave like one of these new parties in other, when that old party starts to behave like one of these parties that does newer stuff, I mean, I think you can look at the time horizon uh, of the party in question, and you can see how really, really short it is that it is willing to sacrifice even things like fundamental acceptance of democracy, which it might need sometime down the road, 
uh, in order to actually achieve goals that are that are right now and 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 of the moment. So the theory says that should work to the detriment of that party. Um, but the United States is an outlier in this case because in one of those other countries, that party dies, it disappears, and it's replaced by a new one. In the United States, there's so much partisanship around that party that that the party seems to be able to act with a short time frame with relative impunity, at least for the moment, because there's no alternative. Right, going to the other party means going to a completely different set of ideas, which you know, even if you could accept some of those ideas, you can't stand the tribal identity that would mean voting for the other side. So it's kind of a worst case scenario when you have a party that behaves with the short term time horizons of a new party, but has that long term kind of social loyalty uh, of an old party. Um, we don't have any models for that. Um, I mean, we are we are the test case for that. Um, and and I don't like being the, the guinea pig, but that's where we're at. That's a that's a great question and very well formulated. Yeah. So when um, a party comes in and there's a new and then it dies and then it gets replaced by a new, is it fair to make it like pretty much a trend, a trend in social media? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely, and this is actually where our research is going. So we're going to start to look at social media forms of organization, and we're going to start to look at the dynamics that are present in social media. Uh, it's interesting, you also see it in corporate dynamics now. So you see a lot of firms being started with the goal of being purchased by a Google or you know, startups that don't exist to become the next Google. They exist so that they can be bought out by Google. Right? So they don't build for the long run. They build to get their product into beta. And then they figure they're just gonna, you know, they're they're just gonna sell. But what you're describing in terms of social media trends, in terms of the, the kind, even the forms of social media that come and go, you know, as we move from MySpace to Facebook to um, you know to Instagram to TikTok or however, like even the forms have really short lifespans. Uh, and I think we're seeing the same thing. To be fair, I think we're seeing the same kind of institutional rotation in almost every sphere of life. That that the institutions are no longer as durable as they used to be. Uh, the next book we're, we're, we're thinking of calling the, the politics of fluidity, because we really feel like we are in a kind of churning space where there really isn't a lot of solid ground that one thing constantly gives way to the next and the next. So I don't think what we're finding is in any way new. We're among the first people to try and think systematically about political parties in this regard. But there are tons of other scholars. And one of the great things that we've been able to do over the last year since we finished the book is to start looking at all of the other literatures, all of the other specializations that are studying the same kind of thing and to learn from them. So some learning from psychology, learning from media studies, learning from business programs, um, that's been really instructive for us. So ab absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to add on. It reminds me of the quote you said when you said one of your lectures, but that picture is like repeating. <laughs> yeah. And it seems to be speeding up in a way, right? It's not just sort of repeating itself and coming back around, but new things are constantly churning, constantly moving forward. There are a couple of questions in the back, yes. Um, in regards to like growth of Turner, what effect does that um, does that have? Does it the growth of these parties, is that increasing? That's the growth of Turner, or is there more, more um, apathy towards the universal system? That's a fantastic question. And so we've done some preliminary work on this. One of the hard things with voter turnout is there's so many factors that affect voter turnout that it's hard to actually say in any given election, was it the new parties that affected voter turnout or not? So we have anecdotal evidence that in some elections, we see spikes that seem to be related to one of these new parties and not to anything else that we can find. But those don't seem to be sustained at the very least. So we, we did try to run a variety of analyses of this and we found a kind of null result. There are certain elections where we think it was responsible in Bulgaria, for example, we see certain peaks. Uh, but in the most recent Bulgarian example, uh, um, actually, we saw a de decrease in turnout. So it's not exactly, it's, it, there's, 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 it's not clear. At, at, at best, the effect is very positive or very small, um, uh, positive, small, uh, or kind of non existent. There are some other questions. There is another one in the back. Yes. I have a question about your view on how social media out of the would be Right. So social media kind of pushed everybody into a zone where things were quick, steady, and set. So 
Right. And so you think that that would reflect the kind of that policy would like to be that in your study? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, so one of the things that I think we see is that content generation, getting in front of people is so much easier than it used to be. It takes so much less money. It takes so much less effort. It takes effort to sustain it, but it doesn't take that much effort to start with. So if you can get a dose of celebrity, if you can get, and you know, and a lot of that, we see that. I mean, when you look at TikTok, it's locked, right? Who gets, who gets sort of, um, you know, mentioned by whom? Uh, and, and kind of forwarded by, you know, by which particular channels. And people are fighting for those little moments of visibility that then spiral. One of the interesting things that we've started to see is these kind of runaway cycles, that these positive feedback loops where you get some visibility and that gets you more visibility and more visibility. So you can start with 10 different people with equal quality, equal, equal um, kind of influence, but one of them by getting just one, one millisecond ahead of the others ends up with all of the results. And so I think that kind of dynamic of the, those, those, those spirals of positive feedback that we see in social media in terms of people, people getting attention, things going viral, the so-called long tail, you know, where, where some are extremely popular in the rest. I think those kinds of patterns are things that we, we see. I'm not saying it's only because of social media, because I think there are other dynamics going on, but it certainly resembles patterns that we see in social media. Does that get at your question? Yeah, it does. And I also wanted to ask, have you ever seen a celebrity in Central um, Europe uh, ask a question about the Republican Party died and then revive another party to gain power? Or if they, their party died, did they die? Not? Right, not physically die. Um, some yes, I have, there have been a couple. So actually, in the Czech Republic, there was a, a, a businessman named Tomio Okumura. Uh, Okumura actually is a Czech Japanese, and, and the Czechs are kind of xenophobic. So it was kind of surprising that he could he could do this. But he was a small businessman. He had, he had worked on kind of Czech Japanese tourism and built a nice travel agency, and he ended up on the Czech equivalent of Shark Tank. Um, he created a party on the basis of that fame. Uh, called the Dawn of Direct Democracy, proposing that they should have referendums on every basic issue. Um, the party got elected. He turned out to be a really kind of difficult person to work with. Um, his ideas weren't particularly kind of useful in the, in the broader realm. And he started to get himself really xenophobic, like really anti-Islam. The people who he'd gotten elected with uh, really disliked where, where it was headed and the party fell apart. So the party fell apart. He was actually expelled from the party. The party kept going. But in the next election, he came back, founded a new party with a very similar name. The party that he left basically disappeared, got zero votes in the next election. And the thing that he created, even though he'd been expelled from the party, basically they expelled their one asset, who had, you know, not a very pleasant asset, but one asset. So he came back around, founded his own party. It was clear it was about him and not about the party, not even about the ideas. And so he's come back in and he's actually done um, survived for two election cycles. Now we'll see how long, how long he survived. What's really interesting about this, and it's related to the Okamura story, is that there were used to be segments of the of the party systems that were quite stable. So the left-wing party, the, the sort of social democratic parties or the Christian democratic parties, those tended to be stable. They would do election after election, and, and they still are for the most part. But the parties on the radical right also used to be stable. And like it or not, there was always a market out there for people who, who hated foreigners, who were anti-Islam, who were anti-Semitic, and so on. So we would see these parties get established, and they would be a kind of long-standing history of radical right parties. One of the interesting things that we've been seeing in the last decade is that even radical right parties are getting unstable, and that they'll come, and then they'll break in half, or, or some new radical right party will replace them. And so you get this churn also in those radical right parties as well. Any other questions? Yes. Can you say that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Stands out in what sense? For example, the Getting the vote, so yeah, yeah. So in terms of like just out of the gate success, it's actually the, the king that we saw in the beginning. So um, King Simeon II, the heir of the Bulgarian king before communism, um, lived all of his life in Western Europe during communism. He wasn't allowed to return to Bulgaria. Uh, but in 2001, he came back to Bulgaria 
said, we need to clean up this place um, and created a political party. And he got 42% of the vote in that first election. Um, but the second election, he was down to 19%. They actually had to rename the party. So instead of the, the National Movement of Simeon II, it became the National Movement for Reconstruction and Development, same initials. Um, and then by the third election, he, had, he was at 3%. So we see that kind of decline. Um, so that's the biggest one, but we've seen a bunch of them start out like just out of the gate at 30%. Uh, and actually in the most recent Bulgarian elections, we see these parties start out the gate. Two different parties in two different elections in one year start out the gate uh, at around 20%, 25% in, the, in, the, in the, the election of last Sunday. So we've seen that happen quite a bit. A bunch of these start very big. And then almost all of them are dead within one or two election cycles. Weirdly, the ones that stand out are the ones that didn't die. So there are, there are two or three parties that we could talk about specifically. Uh, there is a party in Slovakia called Direction, which started out as one of these kinds of new parties. And interestingly, the party started out as one of these new parties, and then it didn't get into government. It wasn't part of the governing coalition. And the party leader decided to retool the party. So he did all of those things that we say you need to survive. He built a brick and mortar apparatus, actually he bought it from another party, which had, was similar and had it. He, he changed the party, not just to be direction, but direction towards social democracy. So he gave it a profile, a left profile. Um, and so he did some of the things that keep parties alive. Same thing happened with the bodyguards party. So in Bulgaria, the bodyguard party actually turned into kind of a conservative standard, conservative center-right party. It also built a really intensive organization. That's actually what's kept it alive. So the parties that actually stand out here aren't the parties that, that, that die. The parties that are unusual are the ones that live. What's interesting about both those two parties that I mentioned is that they have suffered recently. They've fallen below where they were, largely because the one lesson they haven't learned is how to get rid of their leader. Direction is still tied to its original leader. The bodyguard party is still tied to the bodyguard. So the real question is, can these parties that are built around one strong individual learn the lesson, or at least can that individual learn the lesson of handing the reins over to somebody else? Until they can do that, they can't live more than one generation because they're gonna die with their leader. And that's really where the problems come in. Other questions? Yes. Um, I don't hear white people answering so the question. But Probably not, knowing me. Uh, like comparing the two, like which would you say is like better? Because like the two systems, so right? We still have like we have like you know like two party systems. Right. We still have like the same ish problem. Like is there even a system that can solve those things? Yeah, that's a great so. For this, for solving this, you really do get into to the, to the question that John raised, which is, you know, I mean, we, for good or for bad, we have a two-party system, um, and for good or for bad, the, you know, the, those are old, old parties. We don't get the emergence of a lot of new parties. There, I think, there are some real problems with a two-party system in general. Um, I think, you know, in a country where there are 400 kinds of shampoo that you can buy if you go to the campus store, uh, but only two political parties. Uh, it seems kind of limiting. It also seems kind of limiting in terms of kind of polarization. You get this ping pong game back and forth rather than sort of coalitions. There are problems with coalition governments, but some of the studies that have been done have found that, that multi-party systems, at least within a reasonable number, like three or four or five political parties, produce better overall results, higher happiness, controlling for everything else than party, than countries with just two parties. So even with these new, but but that was all, all those studies were done before the new parties sort of came onto the scene. So, you know, this, this opens that space up to all of those new parties. But the worst case scenario is all the disadvantages of a two party system with one of those two parties or both of them acting like a new party. Like that's that's the bottom, that's, that's the absolute worst of both cases. And that's kind of what we're in at the moment. So, you know, I mean, I think if I were to rank them, I would rank sort of, you know, sort of, Old style, stable, multi-party system, and then maybe old style, stable, two-party, or rank that equal with new style, unstable, multi-party, something like that. But then the, the worst is unstable, two-party, or at least with one of the parties unstable. I think that's what we're in at the moment. So, you know, <laughs> welcome to the worst case scenario, I guess. There was another question that I saw, yeah. Right. 
it really depends. And the different ways of doing it are quite, quite diverse. So sometimes, you know, a, a leader will, will, will get out there and say, hey, I'm going to do X, who's with me? You know, and then people sort of accrete and they sort of slowly build around. Um, sometimes they actually sort of, they, they find sponsors, so someone who can contribute the money to get it started. Um, sometimes they, they, they bankroll it themselves and they use their own money. The leader of the largest party in the Czech Republic right now uh, is also the country's second large, second wealthiest leader. Um, so he simply built, he, he has a big firm that deals in agricultural products. He simply built the, the party around his firm. In fact, half of the people that he appointed to parliament had been employees of his firm and so on. So there are, there are different kinds of paths to do it. Some of them are quite easy. Like in his case, it was really quite easy to build a new party because he had that infrastructure already, already there. For other people, it's a lot harder to build, but a lot of them don't care. Like we see these two new guys in Bulgaria. I mean, they started their party 11 weeks ago. Um, and and you know they 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 raised a bunch of money, but we're not exactly sure from where. They spent a lot of it on social media. They hired people, and they ended up being the first place party in the Bulgarian elections. So not difficult. What tends to be difficult for those parties is what happens after is keeping the party together. And one of the really interesting things that happens if you founded your party 11 weeks ago, that means maybe you were thinking about it 15, 16 weeks ago. You have to submit a list of all of the candidates who will be elected on your party it's impossible to vet all of those candidates quickly. And so what we've seen in a bunch of countries is the kinds of people who get elected into parliament are sometimes some really pretty corrupt folks because they manage to sort of buy their way on or persuade their way onto those lists and get into parliament. So it really can be a kind of, it's, 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 it can be an easy process, but easy process in the way that when I build something at home, like it's quick and easy and then it falls apart. And so that's, I mean, that's the downside. Like the, the quicker it is to build, oftentimes the, 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 the more fragile it is when you actually put it into practice. Are there any other questions online? Any others in here? Well, I'm a little shocked here. Um, oh, when... they're in the chat. Thank you. Nick. I'm a Wait. little shocked. Oh, I'm... Hello, Matt, we can't hear you. And I'm not sure. Wait, can you say that again? I'm a little shocked that the public itself doesn't understand this form or this process of, you know, that repeats itself over and over again, but in a di different format. That they, in the long run, I would expect that people should understand this so that they do not somehow vote for someone who is popular, but can c uh, create this corrupt environment for for the in the long so, run. So, so did we. We expected that also. Um, and so it still kind of shocks us every time that we see it. Like there is no, you know, if you were to ask me, there's no chance that this new party in Bulgaria is going to do any better than any of the other ones. Yeah. But they were fresh faced. They had, this group actually has some credentials in anti-corruption, but I can't imagine that it's going to do any better. But people, I think, are so frustrated. I think people are so that they will turn to anything that offers a plausible answer. And I just don't know when that cycle stops. I guess I know. Yeah. Anything else? I'm sorry to do this to those of you in the audience, but let me just see if there's a chat question on here. All right, just a couple of questions from, from online. Um, one writes, I was wondering, does your research show any real advantage of a system political sphere, essentially only two parties like America versus rapid change political work, which is exactly the question that, that, that you asked. And why is it the public hasn't noticed? I think that's the, the question that we just heard. So um, I wish I had better news in a sense, um, but I think sometimes it's at least, it's, it's good to be forewarned that things are headed in a particular direction. Uh, and I know that we have these bigger problems to solve. And I promised at, at the end of the presentation itself to say a little bit about what we can do. I don't think our solution for the most part can, can, can rest in new parties. Um, or parties that have become new and erratic. I mean, I think, and maybe this is just because of my own partisanship, I do see in the more long established Democratic Party, which hasn't been captured by you know, different factions and so on, we do see some of that longer term planning. I think the infrastructure bill and some of the other things actually do look toward a longer future, maybe not perfect, but at least some goals. Um, uh, and I think not even specifically partisan goals, but I think investing in alternative energies, taking the climate seriously is a, is a real question. So sometimes parties can do this and not every party in all of these systems is a new party. 
you do get the survival of older parties. And frankly, the older you get in these systems, the better chance you have of surviving to the next because you build that infrastructure and you build that survival capability. So those older parties are a source of hope. And so we think are other kinds of organizations. And we, we wonder if maybe the, the problem isn't that we're expecting too much of our political parties, that, that in, especially in, in Europe, that we expect them to be these kind of repositories of age old uh, values. Maybe we need to rely instead on civic organizations uh, and, uh, and other kinds of long-term uh, groups, institutions that don't necessarily face that day-to-day -day electoral struggle. And then the other responsibility, and this is, you know, this is this is uh, Louis's question, um, is just that voters have to wise up. I mean, they have to understand the trade-offs. They have to understand that 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 voting for a new party isn't necessarily always going to be a panacea, and quite often it's not. Uh, and in a recent piece that we we, we just published, I mean, we we refer back to you know, old white guy music, back to the Who, that that unless voters do this, they will get fooled again and again. And again, and unless they're willing to, to look at what they're seeing, um, there, there's, there's not an easy way out of that cycle. I want to thank all of you for listening patiently to something which is really abstruse uh, and, and really you know, not something that most people encounter on a daily basis. Um, uh, but uh, I would love to talk more about it if you're interested. There's, there's, there's a, a book which is far too expensive, but I can send you a copy of chapters that you're interested in. Uh, and there are a bunch of articles that we've been doing. So if you're interested in more detail, let me know. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you to those of you online.